everyone, welcome back. We are going to talk here about calcium regulation, and this is going to be a nice little overview for you uh, as we go on and talk uh, particularly about the parathyroid disorders. All right, so a lot of people, when they think calcium disorders, they think of the parathyroids, and that's a good place to start. However, there are a lot of uh, disorders with regards to calcium levels. Uh, that do not in involve the parathyroid glands. And so it helps to have an idea of sort of how this physiology works. We did not cover it in our endocrine physiology overview uh, because I was primarily there talking about pituitary hormones. Uh, however, this is going to be really important for you to know, um, especially as we go on to talk about the parathyroid glands themselves. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost it takes to make these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated and certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel by clicking the little box on the bottom right and you'll get updates and notifications as I put more and more videos up. Now the primary mediators of serum calcium, which is regulated pretty tightly, about nine to 10 and a half, you know, different labs will say different levels, um, those are parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. The big one here, though, is parathyroid hormone, PTH. The primary organisms in play here are the parathyroids, which secrete PTH, bones, which are a reservoir of calcium, the small bowel, which is responsible for absorbing calcium in our diet, and the kidney, which is responsible for getting rid of calcium or reabsorbing it if we need it. The normal serum calcium, as I mentioned, is between about 9 and 10 and a half. If the albumin is low, and we'll come back to this, if their albumin is below 4, then you should use a corrected calcium formula. Or you can get something called the ionized calcium. And that's usually a good thing to get anyway. Calcium stabilizes neuronal membrane and discharges. So what we're going to see with hypercalcemia is that you have sort of a neuronal hypoactivity, whereas with hypercalcemia, the neurons are kind of spastic. You know, they're just firing when they shouldn't be. And we'll see how that uh, works its way into the symptoms. Now, as far as symptoms go, most mild disturbances of calcium are asymptomatic. So typically, if you have a calcium of 10.7, you're not going to show up with symptoms. You'll probably find it incidentally on labs if you're getting a calcium for whatever reason. All right, now let's look at parathyroid hormone. This is released by the parathyroids in response to a low serum calcium. So these cells in the parathyroid, they have sensors and they detect low calcium levels. And when they do so, they release parathyroid hormone, which uh, tells a variety of parts of the body that we need to conserve or we need to mobilize calcium. Um, so the net effect of parathyroid hormone is, most importantly, to increase the serum calcium. And by doing so, it actually also decreases the serum phosphate. So let's just take a look at these effects here. Number one, parathyroid hormone is going to increase the activity of osteoclasts. What that means is that you have demineralization of bone. Remember, bone is primarily calcium and uh, phosphate. So you will increase calcium and increase phosphate that way. Number two, it catalyzes the conversion of 25-hydroxyvitamin D to the active form 125-hydroxyvitamin D. That enzyme is in the kidneys. So this, uh, when, once you have active vitamin D, calcitriol, uh, then what that's going to do is it's going to increase absorption of calcium in the gut. And it also increases absorption of phosphate. Um, now, you might be wondering, okay, I thought this, this causes a decrease in serum phosphate. Well, here's where it happens. Um, yes, yes, you do increase calcium reabsorption in the kidneys, but you also uh, decrease phosphate reabsorption in the kidneys. So in other words, the phosphate level will go down. And it just so happens that this part actually outweighs the uh, increased absorption uh, or the increased mobilization of phosphate. So the net effect is that you have a reduction in phosphate, but of course an increase in calcium. So increase in serum calcium, decrease in serum phosphate. So here's just a, a picture of what I talked about. Uh, important to recognize these three places. The kidney, increased calcium absorption, and increase phosphate excretion, that pretty much tells you what's going to happen, but also that we uh, activate 1-alpha-hydroxylase and that we increase demineralization or resorption at the bone. 
Now, calcitonin is a little bit less important. Um, this is released by parafollicular C cells of the thyroid. So we're not talking parathyroids here, we're talking the thyroid. And this is in response to high serum calcium. So the way that I remember this is calcitonin tones down calcium. So in response to high calcium levels. So the effect here is to decrease the activity of osteoclasts. It actually also increases osteoblast activity, which re reduces bone demineralization and increases mineralization or deposition of bone. It decreases, sorry, it decreases calcium resorption in the kidneys and it also decreases phosphate reabsorption in the kidneys. So the phosphate makes sense. That's going to drop because you're mineralizing bone. You need phosphate to do that. And you're also decreasing phosphate resorption. It's also going to decrease serum calcium because you are laying that calcium down in bone. And you're also decreasing reabsorption in the kidneys. So the result here is a decrease in serum calcium and a decrease in serum phosphate. So here's a picture you can see the two major effects. Now, calcitonin also happens to be a tumor marker. You need to know this for step one. What cancer? Medullary thyroid cancer. All right, remember the medullary thyroid cancer is a tumor of the parafollicular C cells, which are the calcitonin secreting cells. So make sure and remember calcitonin is a marker for medullary thyroid cancer. Okay, so let's look at some of the disturbances of calcium. Now, this is a, a really big overview here, um, but I want, I want you to hone in on the most common causes. All right, so there are so many ways that you can be tested on this, but hypercalcemia is a little bit more commonly tested than hypocalcemia. I have a video where I go over the approach to hypercalcemia. It's not very long, so I would suggest you go and give it a watch. Um, so the number one cause of hypercalcemia is primary hyperparathyroidism. And most of the time, that is due to an adenoma, so a, an autonomous secretor of PTH that grows from the parathyroid gland. Now, another cause is much less common, and that's familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. Basically, what's going on there is that you are uh, peeing out an inappropriately low amount of calcium, and so the calcium is going to build up. Now, malignancy can also do it. So in this case, uh, with this PTHRP, what you have here is a peptide that looks very similar to PTH, and it acts just like PTH, but it's secreted by a tumor. And so it's actually, this is a hypercalcemia of malignancy. It's a perineoplastic syndrome. The big one that causes it is squamous cell lung cancer. However, you can also see it with breast cancer. You can also get hypercalcemia of malignancy due to bone breakdown. So metastasis to the bone, also multiple myeloma can do it. Um, so that's another cause. Medications, thiazide diuretics, and lithium are the two big ones. And then there's other causes. Sarcoidosis. So granulomas make a 1-alpha hydroxylase. So in other words, they will activate vitamin D all on, their, all on their own. So you get sort of this hypervitaminosis D even though you're not you know, taking pills. Uh, so that's kind of how sarcoidosis can show up. And then, of course, vitamin D intoxication. Remember, a fat-soluble vitamin, so you can overdose. With hypocalcemia, the number one cause is hypoparathyroidism um, due to a thyroidectomy. So this would be a primary hypoparathyroidism. The problem is the parathyroid glands. And with a thyroidectomy, you can get this. So why? because the parathyroid glands are very intimately associated with the thyroid. It can be very, very difficult to leave the parathyroid glands in after you do a total thyroidectomy. Um, so it's one of the risks that you take. It's a surgical complication. Another one is hypomagnesemia. Why? This actually causes a primary hypoparathyroidism. Why? Because magnesium is needed to release PTH. So if you have low magnesium, you're going to have a low PTH. Even though the parathyroid gland itself is fine structurally, um, the magnesium is needed to release PTH. Nutritionally, hypovitaminosis D, usually due to malnutrition. Medication, loop diuretics and bisphosphonates. And, of course, malabsorption is a big one. So think of kids with celiac disease, Crohn's disease, and stuff like that. Anything where it's difficult to absorb fat, it's going to be difficult to absorb vitamin D. Also, fat will bind with calcium, making it even worse. 
Some symptoms. So hypercalcemia, remember the mnemonic, stones, bones, moans, and psychiatric overtones. So kidney stones, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Remember that calcium, very high calcium levels will block the effect of ADH. Osteoporosis and bone demineralization, bone pain, abdominal pain, pancreatitis, and neuronal hypoactivity, which can result in lethargy, confusion, and coma. Hypocalcemia will cause neuronal hyperactivity, so think of paresthesias, increased deep tendon reflexes, muscle spasms, tetany, and seizures. Trousseau and Schwastek sign, very uncommon. It's so uh, stereotypical that you probably won't be given that on an exam, and you can get QT prolongation. With hypercalcemia, you can have a short QT. So it may be worth, because these are uh, arrhythmogenic, it may be worth getting an EKG on a patient who's symptomatic hyper, uh, hyper or hypocalcemic.